Let's talk about how we are going to integrate the equations of motion inside a molecular dynamic program. Because it's not obvious. Now, the first thing that we must consider is that usually when we study classical mechanics, we work with infinitesimal time steps. But in the reality, thus in a computer, we'll work with discrete time steps. This means that, of course, we will create some error at each step because actually we are creating some discrete steps that are bigger than zero. Or not infinitesimal, let's say it better. So that's already something we have to deal about. In fact, for example, the most naive idea we could have is to use formulas that are incredibly similar to the ones that we use for uh, no normally when we do classical physics. So the formulas that are very similar to them of the uniformly accelerated uh, motion. So they would look something like this, where you have the v at time t plus delta t is equal to v of t plus delta t acceleration of time t. And the position at time t plus delta t will be equal uh, to the position at time t plus delta t, the velocity at time t plus delta t, because of course we have updated the velocity and thus we will update the position. And actually in some of the most important algorithms we use something quite similar to this, but we don't use exactly this. And let's see a little bit better how we are going to choose an algorithm which are the problems of discrete time step algorithms and in general I said a solution so a very good algorithm. So here is a list of the most important characteristics of the algorithm that we are going to use. It must be fast and occupy as little memory as possible. Yes of k, the part in which we integrate the equation of motion isn't the most time-consuming part of the molecular dynamic program. That's where we calculate the forces. But it's still a good thing to have a fast enough algorithm. And on the other side, it's true that modern computers have very big memory. With memory, I mean their RAM, not the hard disk. Uh, but still, if we are able to use less of that, we can use the amount of memory that we have left for other more interesting things. It must be able to use big time steps because, of course, uh, each algorithm we use will be less and less ideal or near to the ideal result, an ideal algorithm, uh, the bigger the time step is because, of course, it will be more and more different than the classical one. But we will talk about this later. I forgot a point. So, as said, we are interested in being able to use big time steps. Some algorithms will be more stable about it and some less. We want to use big time steps because in this way we can explore more time, more time side system, so more femtoseconds, for example, uh, in less computer time. While if we go to have incredibly small time steps, yes, okay, the system will diverge less from the classical tra trajectory or from the ideal um, trajectory, but on the other hand, we will explore nothing in a huge computer time. That's incredible, that's a nonsense, it's wasteful. Then we want the algorithm to be reversible. That's because uh, Newton's laws are reversible. So the algorithm that has to reproduce it has to be reversible. Again, not each algorithm is reversible. Sometimes you will prefer to use not reversible ones because they have other kinds of perks, but um, usually we'll look for reversible ones. In a reversible one, if we had no uh, numerical error, so if we were using real numbers instead of floating point numbers, we should be able to reverse completely the system and rebring it exactly to the starting point by reversing all velocities at a certain moment. Of course, that's not possible because 
uh, floating point errors are something and can be quite big. It must respect the conservation laws. So if I'm expected to conserve energy, uh, my algorithm should conserve energy at least well enough. If we are supposed to conserve linear momentum, and that's usually what's supposed to happen in molecular dynamics, we want it to be conserved well enough. Of course, it won't be possible to conserve it 100% because we are not using infinitesimal time steps, but we want to be as close as possible to it. It must be easy to program because it uh, makes no sense to create an incredibly, incredibly complex algorithm, uh, even though we have more simpler ones, simply because it will give you a very, very small advantage somewhere, but you need a month to program it and it's full of bugs. It, it doesn't work. It's not worth it. It's not worth it at all. And maybe the most important thing is that it must follow as nearly as close possible and for as long as possible the classical trajectory. Because again, as we are using discrete time steps and more we also have floating point errors, we won't, will never exactly follow the classical trajectory. We will follow another trajectory but we hope that it will be as near as possible to the classical one. Let's talk a little bit better about the importance of following the classical trajectory as nearly as possible and also of conserving energy and momentum, etc, etc. Now, if we have a trajectory in the phase space, so uh, we have a multidimensional phase space and we have this trajectory. That's the classical one. That's if we would be able to analytically solve the many-body problem. This would be the trajectory, whatever it may mean. We will start here at a certain starting point. Our molecular dynamics will also start on the same starting point, because we decide the starting point. The thing is that usually the molecular dynamics will diverge or can diverge very quickly in something completely different. That's that's a problem. That's not something we want. And on the other hand, we could use some kind of algorithm that doesn't respect Duvel's law, so we want to conserve the volume in the phase space. That's even more a problem. There are some situations in which we have to do it, for example if we put a parostat and a thermostat, so in the NPT ensemble, we cannot expect us to conserve and to respect the Duvel law. But at least, as long as we are working in a microcanonical ensemble, we want our algorithm to conserve it, except if we have a good reason to use a different algorithm. So we want something that will conserve the volume in the phase space and will also follow as closely as possible our trajectory, even though we know that it will diverge at a certain point, but it will have diverged not too much for a certain amount of time. Or, and if better, we would like it to keep following more or less nearly a trajectory that makes sense. Of course, at a certain point, we will get something that is completely uncorrelated to the classical trajectory. And it, it actually happens quite quickly. But we will still want to have a trajectory that makes sense, more or less. It's not very easy actually to demonstrate that your algorithm does it. That in the end we don't have much better, but we need molecular dynamics. Uh, but in the other hand, we are not too able to demonstrate always that our algorithm works exactly as we want. But it's not a big problem because we are still able to get experimental results with molecular dynamics. So it means that in the end our algorithms aren't that bad. Then, on the other hand, of course, we know that we will also have, a, if we are still working in a microcanonical ensemble, we would expect the energy to stay constant. But again, we are using discrete time steps, so we know that it won't be constant. It will diverge from the constant value we were interested, and in general from the real value we were interested, at a certain point. First slowly and then it will diverge completely. Now, again, we want uh, an algorithm that won't be too drastic. We won't, don't want to have dramatic increases or decreases in the energy. 
we want to have more energy that more or less keeps going like the, no, the energy we were expecting. So, yeah, if we know that the energy should do something like this, yeah, it's okay, it will diverge a little bit, somewhere here it will go completely nuts, but we want it to behave properly. And there are actually some algorithms, like the velocity relay that we will talk in other, later on, that um, cons don't conserve the true Hamiltonian, but they conserve a pseudo-Hamiltonian. And therefore, uh, we can ar make the actual energy inside the molecular dynamics arbitrarily close to the um, actual energy by maintaining the precision of the calculation we are doing. While with other algorithms, we cannot do it. E even if we could theoretically reduce the time step and make, have a huge numerical precision, we would still diverge incredibly. So, these are all things we have to bear in mind. There is no perfect algorithm. There is no algorithm that does everything and that does everything perfectly. Everything has its pros and its cons, and you will always have to see what's better for you in that exact moment, and a little bit knowing the pros and the cons of the most important algorithms, or at least of the one that you are using right now. So, at this point, let's talk about the velocity overlay. It also does exist the normal Verlet, the more classical one, but they are equivalent, and Velocity Verlet is one of the most used ones. Uh, it's very loved because it's reversible, it's stable, it conserves energy and linear momentum, if we have conservative forces, of course, and it's fast. And we also can calculate velocity with a good precision. If I'm not wrong, it should be uh, in an order of delta t at the fourth power, if, I'm, if I don't remember wrong. Now, how does it work? It's quite easy. At the beginning, we calculate if we have a certain time step. We will calculate the velocity for t plus one half of the time step. Then we will calculate the position for the time step using this updated velocity. Then we will calculate the forces I will put it in brackets because it's not directly about integrating equation of motions but it's interesting to know that we are going to calculate the forces the for says here and then we are going to calculate the velocity for the last part so for t plus delta t so the other half of the velocity with the new forces and then we'll go back here so again we calculate the other another half position forces then again the velocities and you can see let, let's what, now that we know that the forces are here, let's put them away because we want to give more importance to the algorithm. So you can see that it's uh, reversible because it's symmetric. You, ca you can really distinguish one direction from the other one. And that's actually the reason why it's reversible. It's stable and it's quite easy. Uh, the velocities are calculated quite simply. It's v of t plus one half delta t is the acceleration, the acceleration at a certain time t. Then we will get the position as r of t plus the whole delta t times the new velocity we have, t plus one half delta t. And then this will be, again, something similar to this, but it will be V of T plus one half delta T plus one half delta T A of T plus 
delta t because we are using the new acceleration that we calculated here with the forces. So that's the algorithm. We calculate the velocities with the old forces. We calculate the position using this updated velocity. Then we re-update the velocity with the other half of the time step with the new forces that we have calculated here. And then we start again, recalculating half a time step with the old forces, position, etc, etc, etc. That's the velocity Berlet algorithm. The interesting thing is that this is one of the algorithms that do conserve a uh, pseudo Hamiltonian, and so we know that um, the divergence of the energy won't be dramatic. Of course, if you are interested, there are plenty of other algorithms like leapfrog, the classical Verlet predictor corrector, etc., etc., etc. There are a huge number of them, and I may talk about them in different videos. In any case, you can find a good discussion, discussion about these algorithms in the books that are written in the description. I hope you enjoyed the video. All the sources and the materials I used to do it are written in the description below. And here is some more content for you. But wait, don't click on it yet. First remember to leave a feedback in the comments section to let me know what you think about it. Like, subscribe, follow me on social media links in the description, and if you would like to support the channel, consider to donate on Patreon. Again, link in the description below. See you next time, I'm Maurice Karnbrock for The Computational Chemist.